Well, welcome to February. Happy Valentine's Day. I may I just say I love you. I thank God for this congregation. I know that God is on the move, and we are speaking in the month of February on one of my favorite topics, the word power. The right power right now. There's just something about power, and I'm not talking about political power. I'm talking about when God gets hold of a broken vessel and heals them and delivers them, and they're not who they used to be. He gets hold of a shy person. He gets hold of someone that has been through terrible situations in life, and he gets a hold of them and transforms them, and the people that know them best say of them, what happened there, right? So I want you to think of the disciples, uh, the, the 11. You know, we know Judas committed suicide. There was, there was the 11 left. And they were told by Jesus, uh, go and wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. He says it this way, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now think of little guys, little ordinary guys who never planned leaving their hometown. These homeboys never planned leaving Galilee ever. Because they were pigeonholed by society that if you were not the upper echelon in the educational system of the day, you just simply became part of your father's business. So we have Peter, James, and John who were fishermen, which meant that they were not good enough. When they got there to about 12, 13 years old, a decision was made between them and the educational system that you guys aren't that smart. How about you just do this vocational thing over here? Are you with me? But when Jesus came, he says, give me these guys. Give me the one that the world says can't do it and give me these guys because I will give them not only an education, I will give them power. Now what if Calvary Church, in estimation against the other churches of this town, in Assembly of God manner, there's First Assembly, which is about 3,000 strong. We would say that is a powerful church. New Life Assembly has about 2,000 people that attend there each week. We would say, wow, that's a big, powerful church. Faith Assembly, about 1,000 over there, right? Something like, I mean, we would say these are big, powerful churches. And then there's little old Calvary. We're not even into the word th. We haven't even approached, huh. <laughs> we have people here. And you shall receive power. You shall receive power, the right power, right now. How many of you remember your first red ant bite? You remember? You remember where you were? You remember what happened to you? Some of us, my wife looks at me when I get bit by one ant. She's like, my God, what happened to you? You have boils growing out of your body. What, what happened to you? Second grade, I lived in Bradenton, Florida. There was a pond just nearby from our housing development, and I decided that I would go, I don't know if any of you have ever done this, I call it um, sandwich bag fishing. You put a rock in a bag, you open the mouth of the bag, and whatever swims in, you scoop it up. I was fishing as far as I was concerned. Well, I'm standing there waiting for something to swim into my bag, and I didn't know it. I was standing, how do I say it, in a colony of billions <laughs> of red ants. And here's the thing about red ants. They don't bite on the first. They wait until yeah, they, there's a billion of them on you, and one ant says... Okay, bite. And in unison, they bite. Well, when that command went out, I looked down and I was covered from my knees to my toes in red ants. And they said, bite. And I was like, whoa, there's power, power, wonder working power. 
I had never experienced a red ant. I didn't know what it was. All I knew is I wanted it off. Thank God get, God gave me some sort of intellect. Run into the water, son. So I ran into the water and got them all off as quickly as possible. But it was not without escape or injury. Now I say all that to say you can be covered by some stuff that causes you injury. Come on, somebody. You can be covered by stuff or you can be covered by the love of God. I want to talk to you this morning about being armed in love, covered in the love of God. Are we all right with this this morning on Valentine's? An appropriate subject matter, being covered by the love of God. Now, I was a bit confused because, you know, in the scriptures, we have recorded for us the armor of God. Are you all familiar with the armor of God? They are coverings. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us we, we have the belt of truth right? We have the breastplate of righteousness. We have the shoes of the gospel of peace. We have the shield of faith. We have the helmet of salvation, and we have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we would all read that and say, oh, that's power. Look how powerful that is. They are all exterior garments that shows the devil whose team you're on. Are you with me? Because Isaiah teaches us that guess who's wearing a helmet of salvation? God himself is wearing a breastplate of righteousness. So when you put the outer garments on, you are saying to the enemy's camp, we're not on your team, we're on his. But I didn't grow up in the South. I grew up in the wilds, cold, north of Pennsylvania. And I want to tell you, come the end of November, on through to somewhere around April, Pennsylvania may as well be renamed Narnia. It's covered in this white, frosty, depressing, ugh. it's cold, it's nasty, and you don't want to go outside unless somebody's invited you sled riding, skiing, snowboarding, something that will at least alleviate the pain of having to live in these conditions. I walked out of the concert last night and I thought, oh, thank God I live in Florida. Thank God. I mean, it was just balmy and warm last night. I thought, it's February. I love it. It's February. St. Valentine's Day Eve, and I think sweat is dripping down my face. I love it. Narnia, not so much. Because getting dressed in the north for a day to go to work starts with, yes, layers. We have this stuff called thermal underwear. You put these pants on and and tops that make you look, at least a guy like me, anorexic, because it squeezes you. You're like, oh my God, put some clothes on. So comes the next layer, the exterior. I don't know if you've even heard of these. There's flannel jeans. These are jeans with a layer of flannel, because I don't, I don't know if you understand this, negative 30 is a real temperature up north with wind chill factors that will put it somewhere at 45 below. And the, and the guy doing the weather will look at you through the lens of the camera and say, I dare you to go outside. They give pet warnings. Do not leave your pets outside. They will die. All right? All right. Do you understand how cold it is? And you've got to go outside. Some people work in this all day long. Some people just drive in it and, and run to their office and go out for smoke breaks. But to go outside in those conditions, 
Sometimes your, your, your thermal underwear and your flannel jeans and a sweater ain't enough. Next comes a heavy coat. Next comes a hat. And I'm not talking about a baseball hat. I mean, watch the fashion industry come alive. I mean, they've got ear flap, chin straps, big old balls on hats. I mean, knit, heavy winter. I laugh every winter when I see somebody in Florida wearing one. I'm like, it ain't even cold. It ain't even, well, get that off your head. Is that a parka you're wearing? It's 50 degrees. Shut up. Get that off. If it's cold enough, your heavy jacket comes with a hood with a drawstring, so all you see is a set of eyeballs. And we thought the mass culture was new. If you're really brave, you'll wrap a scarf around that. Where are you going? To work. Gloves. And I'm not talking about thin work gloves to weed the garden. I'm talking thick gloves. Pull those suckers on and your hands are just... What was that, a Christmas story? I can't move my arms. <laughs> You've suddenly gained 40 pounds and haven't eaten breakfast yet. And there's this awful moment where you're sweating because you haven't gone outside yet. And you're in these multiple layers, and there's a panic that hits you. What if that freezes? What if my sweat freezes? <laughs> I'm, I'm in bad shape here. So most of those garments go on right before you go out. Some people have a mud room, which is about half the temperature of what you're going into. So you, you ease into the temperature. Are you with me? Now, why am I telling you all this? The garments that we read about in Ephesians... Sometimes ain't enough. Sometimes you're going to feel the cold wind of demonic behavior blow past you. And have you ever been there? You feel all of the enemy camp around you. And you're like, why, Lord? I, I thought I had on the garments. I thought I had on all the stuff. I thought I was ready for the windy, chilly conditions of evil that would be before me. And he says, oh, Son, daughter, you, you, you've still got some more garments to put on. You haven't yet put on my love. Because when you put on my love, love will cover a multitude of sin. So to mo this morning we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter number 4. And you were thinking, what is this guy going to stop talking about snow and cold and start preaching? But in 1 Peter chapter number 4, we have that very verse. I'm going to read verse 7 and 8. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love one for another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Are you with me? Now, in what context does he say this? Peter writes his letter to a group of people that he names as people living in Babylon. If you know your geography, Babylon is modern-day Iraq. There were the people of God, Israelites, living in bondage to Iraqis. Now, what if we told you on the news this morning that there were a bunch of Israelites held in bondage under the government, the stronghold of an Iraqi dictator, and he was forcing a lifestyle upon them that was not comfortable for them physically, spiritually, or emotionally. What do you do? That is the context in which 
Peter is writing a letter to a group of people that have written him a letter, and they've written him a letter that goes like this. Pastor, we are living in homes where we're, it's not our house. People have taken over our homes, taken them from us, and we have become the slave labor of the people that have moved into our house. Furthermore, they're, they're burning our scrolls and our scriptures, and they've moved in a, a system of gods that are foreign to us, and they're expecting us to bow down to their gods. Peter, pastor, what should we do? Do you understand the context? Because if you do not bow down to the slave owner's God, what will happen to you? You can be beaten. You can be tortured. You can be killed. And all you're trying to do is wake up each morning and protect your family and go through the day without dying. You believe in God. You believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You believe in a miracle worker. You believe in the way maker. You believe that God is on the move. You are in the period of history where you believe in Jesus, Messiah. He's a way maker. He is the one that brings change into the life of people but what happens when you are robbed of your worship? America, we're not there yet, but I have a feeling we're headed towards a godless nation that will try to steal our ability to worship in spirit and in truth. And what if you're at home and the government, I mean, I'm just pontificating, what if the government decides you shouldn't own your home? I oh, know, I'm just thinking out loud, but what if they decided one day that socialism is the way and that you should share your home with someone and it's not your home anymore, it is the property of the government and they will take your home and a family will move in. And they begin to dictate to you what, when, and how you worship. And it ain't God. Would any of you be hitting your cell phone to say, Pastor, what do we do? What do we do? And what if I wrote back to you, guys, the end of all things is closer than you think. What if, that, what if I didn't answer your question directly? What if I said, you know what you should do? Because this situation is happening, what I want you to do is be very serious in your prayer life. Do you think that if your home was stolen from you and your freedom was stolen from you and a patron idolic God was put in your house right where the place where your holy Bible used to sit, that they threw your holy Bible out and there sits an idol and they stand there with a, a nine millimeter pointed at your head and say, you're going to worship our household God or else, what do you do? So you text me, Pastor Kevin, what do I do? And I say back to you, bend a knee, but not to the idol. You go find a place in that house, and you get gut serious with God. God, it's time. I'm being pressured like I've never been pressured before in my life. God, I'm really going through it. God, I don't understand it. But I've never been more serious about my prayer than I am now. Have you ever noticed that about your life? That when you're thrown into a den of lions, suddenly you get serious about your prayers. God, are you up there? These lions look hungry. God, are you listening? It doesn't feel like I'm going to make it. It doesn't feel like I'm going to survive the moment that I'm going through. And Peter doesn't say, create a rebellion. He doesn't say, go get your own gun. He doesn't say any of that. He says, be watchful and serious about your prayer. 
Because I feel like when things are going well, we just throw up some, hey, God, if you can make it a good day, that'd be all right. Hey, God, if you give me a parking place near the door at the supermarket, awesome. But what if your freedom's being stolen? I mean, are you throwing up skipping prayers? Or have you learned in the prayer closet to weep before God because humanity is lost and pressuring you to be lost with it? Hey, pastor, this is pretty good. Huh. Yeah, I know. Because God is delivering unto us the right power right now. The history of the church, the prayer meeting, is the least popular, least attended function that a church could do. Except in American history, on 9-11... For some reason, on a Tuesday night, every church in America had a prayer meeting. And it was filled from the front to the back and side to side. Why? Why? Because suddenly we had our first real threat. The invincible America certainly felt vulnerable on the morning of September 11th. I remember the frenzy of people. I was in the church office in Noonan, Georgia, and there was a frenzy of people coming in. Pastor, what is going on? Pastor, what is happening? I heard women travailing and weeping in the hallways and in the sanctuary, and it wasn't long until we called a prayer meeting, and it was standing room only. People crying out to God. Where would we get this idea that in tragedy, in difficulty, in pain and sorrow, that somewhere our helmet of salvation ain't enough? That somewhere the breastplate of righteousness just ain't touching what's going on? Come on, somebody. Is there more? Do I need more? Is there something that I could possess, that I could put on, that would cover me? Well, Peter would say, well... You know, everybody just needs to calm down for a minute. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the stuff we tend to worry about. He'll take care of. Are you with me still? Are you alive? Tap somebody. So I think the preacher's trying to say something. Now, he goes on to say, Above all things, verse 8, have fervent love for one another. <laughs> Peter, maybe you didn't hear me. My house was stolen from me. Another family moved in. We have become slave labor. And you want me to pray? Okay, I get it. You want me to love these no good thieves that have stolen from me? You want what? What kind of answer is this anyway? You, and not just love. Did you hear what he said? Fervent. Now, if you have fervent love for someone, what does that mean exactly? I mean, I can stand up here and say I love you and watch you walk out into traffic and not say a word. And watch you get hit by a car and say, well, that was a shame. Or, if I say I love you and I see you walking towards traffic and I run, and tackle you and pull you back on top of my body, causing my ribs and lungs much damage because I risk my life for you and I stretch out everything I've got to rescue you, that's fervent. Gentlemen, pay attention. Fervent love. 
Now, the word love is the word agape in the Hebrew here, and that is a God received. If we were studying Hebrew together, there would be the noun agape. There would be the verb agapeo, which means I can't give you agapeo unless I have received it from the flood banks of heaven. Are you with me, church? I can't give you something I ain't got. I can't spend the currency of heaven unless I've stood before the Father and received it. Thus, the serious prayer life. Where do I get this fervent ability? Where do I get this ability to stretch myself in the direction of someone that is destroying themselves? Destroying you in the process. Where do I get this, Lord? During your time in prayer where you're seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and you begin to cry out to Him, and the Lord says, I see your breastplate of righteousness. I see your helmet of salvation. I see your belt buckle of truth. I see your preparation in the gospel. Now let me give you some agape so you can give some love to people that do not deserve it. Now why would that be the answer to such a question? Can't we call our congressmen and get these people off our necks? That's the very thing that the apostles tried to say to Jesus just prior to his ascension. Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? No. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We're not here to destroy the political network of evil. We're here to establish the kingdom of God. So Peter doesn't answer their politically charged question. He answers, you need to seek the kingdom of God. The love of God will come down upon you and cover you so that out comes fervent love for people that are politically charged against you. So I want you to think of the adversary that would believe that this church and all churches should be shut down. And they are on your Facebook page and they irritate the snot out of you. You've tried repeatedly to delete them, but somehow they just keep, it's whack-a-mole. I, I thought I deleted you. And here they come. I thought I shut you up. I thought I shut you down. And God says, you know, you know what you should do? You should invite them over. You should find out what their favorite meal is. You should find out how they like it prepared. You should find out the activities they like to do. And you should bring them into your house. Pastor, they're the devil! Not if you see them through the new lens of Almighty God. For God so loved the world, which includes your adversaries. The people that have caused you harm and debilitating things in your life, God says, you know what I want you to do is, I want you to get on your knees and have some fervent prayer, and then I want you to get up and demonstrate some fervent love. Why, Lord? Because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, I struggled as I studied this because the word in the Greek actually translates as the word veil, as in what a bride would wear when she walks down the aisle. Love veils your face from what's going on. Are you catching it, guys? When you demonstrate the love of God, you stop looking at all the negatives. You stop looking at all the nasty, and guess what you start to see? Because a veil is not completely a, a black slate over your eyes. You can see through it. But somehow when you, when you put on the love of God, 
and display the love of God fervently, risking your life for someone who causes you injury and harm. In this case, a slave owner that is demanding that you worship their God. Why don't you sashay up to the idol and not pray to it, but give glory to God? They can't control your tongues. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And when they did... Tongues of fire sat upon them, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God enabled them. So what if you sashay up in front of the idol? Oh, didn't we learn this a few weeks when you bow down and you lift a hand to heaven? And they think you're worshiping the house idol, but you're worshiping the Lord your God in a tongue that they can't even understand what you're saying. Pastor, are you, are you suggesting that I subject myself to their, their remarks, their pain, their falsehoods? Oh, I'm not saying that. I'm saying you demonstrate the love of God that you're not willing to raise a rebellion. You're ready to raise the house unto Jesus Christ. And when you do, it begins to cover every fault that they have. And suddenly you see them as lost and in need of a Savior. And every prayer becomes about, Lord, can you give me an opportunity to have a discussion about the Lordship of Jesus Christ? I'll give you a little story and we'll close up out of here. Before I became a pastor, I had several jobs. One of them was at UPS. UPS is a, a slave labor camp of cardboard. Where you're just hustling boxes into trucks that are going around the nation and around the globe. So they hire young and work you till you die. I got out of there before they killed me. I so saw I'm putting boxes away. And the Lord says, it's not enough. What, what are you talking about? Tomorrow, you're going to go to the store and you're going to buy a six-pack of white T-shirts and a pack of Crayola markers. Okay. Okay. I buy these items and I go home. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to put one of your co-workers' name right there on your belly and right above it, I'm praying for, oh, Lord, that no. Mm. That, that, ain't, that ain't even happening. Do you know the environment, the godless environment I work in? Are you serious? And as soon as I get the word serious out of my mouth, it was as though the thunder of heaven. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, sir. And so I did it. I was a... You know Yahtzee? That's how bad I was shaking going into... If you could listen to my bones clatter and you would have thought, he's a, he's a game of Yahtzee going into work. He's shaking. And so I go into work thinking, what, what is he going to think of me? With my name on his belly, he's going to think I want to be his boyfriend. I know. No, God, no. Went the whole, work, whole night Nobody said a word to me. I mean, nobody wanted to have friendly chat with me. Nobody, nobody, not him, not anybody else. I went home. I thought, oh, God. What now? He said, wash it. That name's going to wash out of it. Put your next. What are we doing? What are we doing? This is so embarrassing. I just want to go put boxes away, get my paycheck, and go home. Mm -mm. 
three weeks into this, in the bathroom of all places, at the urinal, I get a tap on the shoulder. It was the first guy. He said, I've been watching you for three weeks. Is this a game or are you serious? Let me finish here. <laughs> can, you, can you back up? Let me wash my hands and we'll go to the break room. My God. I'm... But so, there's something when people need transformation. They don't even care if they accost you at the urinal. So we get in the break room. He said, how did you know? What have you been praying over me anyway? Because the last three weeks of my life, I think it's God telling me I'm supposed to talk to you. When if I could tell you I didn't even like to work with this guy, if I could get a truck as far away from him as possible, that would be a decent night for me. And yet he puts me in the break room right across from me to share my faith with him to lead him to the saving grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Are, are you... To take the time to love somebody and risk everything so that one would be saved. What if we attempted the God thing, not just in this Sunday morning worship, but that God actually loves people that we can't stand, that cause us pain, sorrow, and grief, and he wants to use us to shine the light and love of Christ into their life, and we can say, happy Valentine's Day. God loves you, and so do I. Are, are you semi-glad you, you came to church this morning? Because I believe that wickedness is trying to somehow blow its cold winds in front of us to cause us to shudder and think that we don't have enough that we would turn away and just somehow shudder against the cold and then eventually wither and die. When God says, are you kidding me? There's another level of garment that you can wear that will drive away the multitude of sin that is trying to choke your life out. That's pretty good preaching, isn't it? Look what the Holy Spirit can do with a dummy like me. So some of you, maybe all of you in this room, there's somebody that came to your attention that you've just kind of pushed to the extremities. And I believe God's calling you not to push them out, but to pull them in, to demonstrate that you've been in the prayer closet with the Almighty so that you can demonstrate the love of God to them. Am I making any sense this morning? Sister, would you come? I've asked for a specific song. I'm sorry if you don't know it, but I was impacted in my walk with the Lord by the name of a guy uh, uh, in the Christian song industry. His name is Alvin Slaughter. And my, my wife and I would ride around in the car and listen to this and many other Alvin Slaughter songs. And it was actually part of our early married life, just listening to these songs. And Alvin Slaughter came to our church where we were attending. And there came, and we used to do this in church where they would pause before we all sat down and you would shake hands with people. And this is a church of like 3,000 people. So you get like 3,000 people fellowshipping. It's not real quick. So you, we're, we're doing that. We're talking to our friends, shaking hands, doing all this. And I watched my wife because Alvin Slaughter was a guest and he was just kind of standing there looking around. And she ran over and just gave him a big old, I mean, he's a towering man. And my wife's a bit shorter than he. And just gave him a big old, big old hug. 
And I, I thought about that moment in connection with this service, in connection to the song that he would get up and sing, Oh, the glory of his presence. And I just want you to hear the song. If you just want to close your eyes, allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. After the song, we're going to close in prayer. If you want to make your way to the altar, that's fine. If you need prayer, if you need help, if you need strength to do this, some people will meet you here to pray. Whatever the Holy Spirit is causing you to do in response to this message, I just want you to be obedient. Can you hear that this morning? Let the love of Christ compel us to be the men and women of God, to live the right power right now. Oh, the glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your divine presence. We thank you for your divine anointing. We thank you for your clarity about real power. I pray, Father, that we would not be out for the fight against other people. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality and power in high places. And if that be the case, Lord, that we would not fight this battle in the flesh, but we would fight it according to your will. So I pray that we would be covered, armed with the love of God. That our eyes would be shielded from the attributes of others that would cause us to want to harm them. But instead, we would look through the lens of love and see them as you do and that we would live such extraordinary lives that the gospel would be preached and we would see the salvation of many and father we ask this firmly established in the wonderful and the mighty power of god in jesus name amen and amen god bless you i love you we'll see you on wednesday night